All right, guys. So uh, I think it's a good time that we started. Uh, like I said, thank you so much to everybody who has joined. My name is Flavin Joseph, and we are going to have a really, really interesting session. Um, the focal point for today's discussion is about the General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR. And, uh, and I, I take it for granted that just the fact that you're here in this room today um, it implies that you are, you are familiar with the regulation and that you have a good understanding of what it is. Um, the focal point again for the session today is going to be what how do we actually address the regulation all right so you're going to stress more about the how to aspects of gdpr uh, but before that just to set the context and to make sure that everyone is um, is aligned in terms of their understanding of gdpr how i'm going to structure the discussion is we're going to first look at why we needed gdpr what, what is the reasons that gdpr actually um, came into existence and then the, the who aspects of GDPR, who are the various entities that are that are um, at play when it comes to GDPR, and um, and the what aspects as well of GDPR. What the, you know, the some certain um, uh, explanations about the various um, aspects of GDPR. And with this background, we are going to look at the most important question, which is how do we address GDPR? All right, I've got a really really interesting roadmap that I'll show you as we go down, um, as we go down the screen. Uh, as we go down the slides and we look at how a typical organization can actually implement GDPR. All right, so this is the, the high level agenda that I have guys. And, and like I said, the context is gonna be a, a, with more focus on the meta region. How does GDPR apply to meta organizations? And then how do we go about actually addressing this? All right, perfect, thank you. So guys, if you have any questions, I see that the chat window is disabled, but there's a Q and A window as well. Please, please, please feel free to type in your questions at any point in time. I'm gonna dedicate at least five, five to 10 minutes towards the end just for addressing your questions. All right, so um, please feel free to type them in at any point in time. All right, done. So guys, let's start with the why, why aspects of GDPR, like I said. So the first question we really need to understand is why did Europe need GDPR? All right, now, um, this is a very, very self-explanatory question. I mean, in fact, no one in this room here today is gonna to be a stranger to the fact that an individual's control over his or her personal data has been falling, you know, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years or so, all right? Um, just the fact that we use things like social media or, or, uh, or any online application means that we have limited control over our own personal data. And if you're familiar with the definition of privacy, this is exactly, this is going exactly contradictory to the definition of what privacy is really. All right, so if you, I mean, many of us are familiar with what security is, cyber security or information security, is the focus of security is to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of information systems, and this is straightforward. Privacy, on the other hand, is a far, far bigger and, and, and more expansive field for that matter. All right, a very, very foundational definition of privacy is how far can you or me as an individual exercise control over our own personal data? All right, what is the definition of personal data? This again is a very, very expansive term. And these are the two areas that GDPR is seeking effectively to address. All right, the definition of privacy itself. How far can you or me as an individual exercise control? Um, Vinesha, there's a question. Can I please share the slides? Um, we'll, we'll look at this uh, definitely, Vinay. Thank you, thank you um, for the question. Um, but, but like I said, um, um, the, the key focal area that GDPR seeks to address is how far can EU individuals actually exercise control over their own privacy, all right? So uh, there are multiple reasons, like I said, that individuals, is, that individuals control over their privacy has been receding over the past 10 to 15 years. The first one is technology. Um, new data-driven driven technologies mean that individuals have limited control over their own privacy, or in fact, many of them don't even know what is happening in relation to their own privacy. All right, so um, use of uh, platforms like social media or online applications, or just the fact that you use an Android phone, for example, means that a lot of data is being collected about you 24 seven. All right, um, and, and we have limited control over this data. We don't know where this data is gonna be used. Who are the third parties who are going to have this data? How long is this data going to be, going to be retained by the, by the company to whom we are trusting this data? All right, so uh, GDPR addresses this, and how does this do this? There are enhanced rights for data subjects, like you can see here on the screen. All right, you uh, or me as an individual has um, is, is given a lot of enhancements in terms of data subject rights, 
In fact, I don't know if you've heard about this, but there are subject access requests, right, request right to uh, request um, transfer of your data from one data controller to another data controller. The right to request to be completely forgotten, which means every single piece of your data that a controller holds has to be deleted. And you as a data subject have the right to request this. All right. There are also requirements for new technologies such as profiling, online behavioral advertising, cookies, etc. Um, uh, that GDPR is actually bringing in. So if a company is engaged in monitoring or profiling of an individual by uh, tracking their activities, essentially, you know, this is what profiling or, um, or, or cookies and so, and so on are actually focused upon. If a company is focused on uh, carrying out these activities, there are specific requirements that GDPR brings in for them as well. All right, so it is really, really updated in terms of the new technologies that have happened, uh, that, have, that have come into existence over the past few years. Um, and in case you are not aware, the regulation that preceded GDPR was called the Data Protection Directive. This is a regulation or directive rather from 1990. All right, it is it is extremely outdated um, and from 1995, in fact, and it is extremely outdated, not at all in uh, relevant to the technologies that we have today. So there was a very, very massive need for updating the data privacy regulation, and this is one of the key uh, factors that gave impetus to GDPR itself. All right. Another problem that organizations had was the lack of in-house privacy expertise. Okay, so this is this is a situation that we continue to see not only in the privacy world but also in the cybersecurity world. All right, multiple organizations across the world of different sizes and shapes, uh, you know, with, with with n number of employees, they know that they are required to comply with certain um, laws and regulations, both in the area of security and privacy. The problem is they don't know how. They don't know how they have to go about and actually implement this. Uh, so the answer to this is the data protection officer, which is a position that GDPR has mandated, depending upon the, the depending upon specific organizations. But what is interesting is it does not depend upon the size of the organization at all. All right. So if an organization is in, is involved in offering significant um, goods or services to to uh, to EU individuals, or is involved in uh, monitoring of EU uh, of, of the behavior of EU individuals they will have to hire what we call a data protection officer. All right, this person is supposed to be an in-house expert on data privacy uh, and an expert on GDPR itself. All right, and this is something that the GDPR, that the, the GDPR mandates, uh, like I said, on organizations. Um, and and, and um, there are specific requirements that a DPO has to meet in order to qualify for the position. All right, another interesting development that has occurred recently is cybersecurity as well as data privacy related breaches. Uh, you and I are definitely no stranger to this. In fact, the most recent one was the Cambridge Analytica scandal uh, that was rocking um, the well-known social media giant Facebook. Um, and, and in fact, Facebook was brought under a lot of heavy criticism for sharing uh, for, or, or for giving you know, uh, an app developer the ability to share end users' personal data with a third party. And this was done without the consent or even the awareness of many of these end users. All right, so a number of cybersecurity as well as data privacy related breaches is also one of the reasons that we needed uh, a change to the privacy regulation itself. And GDPR addresses this by having very, very strict and stringent breach notification requirements, as well as data security requirements. You know, there are new, there are new concepts about what we call data pseudonymization that GDPR brings in. And further, it also reinforces the concepts of privacy by design as well as privacy by default. There are specific articles that talk about how organizations need to go about and address these, all right, within GDPR. The last one is outsourcing or, um, uh, yeah, you know, um, use the, the engaging of engagement of third-party suppliers or third-party service providers to carry out very, very critical business functions. This is something which is actually, um, uh, again, you are no stranger to this fact. This is a trend that has actually evolved significantly into tremendous industries itself over the last uh, one to two decades. All right, the problem is, there is an absence of accountability for privacy. You see, you see what this means, right? So uh, the primary uh, client would say that, hey, you know what, I've outsourced these processes to a third party service provider. Typical example being a cloud service provider, let's, let's take for example. So they are responsible for implementation of controls around you know, user privacy and user security itself for that matter. And then in some very, very minute cases, a cloud service provider would come back and say, you know what, these requirements are controlled by the client because the client owns the data. So I don't have any ownership or implementation of controls around, um, around this data or for managing the privacy of the data itself. So GDPR brings about clear responsibilities or clear lines of accountability between data processors and data controllers. 
All right, this is something that uh, is also taken care of with DDPR. And guys, you might have noticed that I use the terms data controller and data processors uh, quite often on the slide. Do not worry, I'm gonna explain each of these terms as well when we talk about the who aspects of GDPR. All right, so guys, this slide, um, I really wanted to set the context for why we need a GDPR. If you have any questions, like I said, feel free to just chat them away at any point in time. I will take them on the spot if possible, or we'll, uh, or like I said, we have five to 10 minutes at the end where we look at all the, uh, at all the uh, questions. All right, now we are coming down to the next aspect of GDPR, which is the who. Who are the elements at play in the GDPR world? All right, now, um, if you remember, I said GDPR's core focus is about giving individuals control over their own data, their own privacy, all right? This individual is what we call the data subject. Any natural person who is identified or is identifiable is called a data subject. And GDPR, like you already know, is concerned only with European Union individuals. So this means you have to be either an EU citizen or an EU resident. This means you are covered under GDPR, all right? So uh, an identified or identifiable natural person, which means this person has to be alive. That's all there is. So any person who is not yet passed away is definitely covered under GDPR as long as, like I said, he, is, he or she is an EU individual, uh, which is a citizen or a resident of the European Union. All right. Um, so he or she has to be already identifiable by means of what we call personal or sensitive personal data. Or he can be identified by putting together multiple pieces of data, let's say. He, he or she can be uniquely identified. So this person or this entity is at the center of the entire regulation. And uh, the other concerned entities are what we have, what we call the data controller and the data processor. All right, the data controller is the entity that determines the how and the why of data processing. The purposes and the means of data processing, which is the how and the why, is determined by the data controller. And the data processor, this is the entity who processes data purely on behalf of the data controller. Now, let me give you an example. So assume the data subject walks up to a bank and says, hey, I want to open up a new bank account with you. So he submits his data to the bank. All right, the bank decides the how and the why of processing this data. This data can be anything like his name, his uh, existing financial details, his um, uh, nationality, his racial de uh, details, um, uh, as well as his financial, um, uh, you know, his salary and all, the, all these aspects as well. All right, so all of this is data that can be un used to uniquely identify this individual. And thereby this data definitely falls in as personal data under the definition of GDPR. The bank determines the how and the why of processing of this data and therefore the bank is a data controller, all right? Now let's assume the bank shares this data with a third party service provider, let's say a call center, which is based in India or China or Philippines, wherever it is, all right? The bank shares this data with this call center so that the customer can call, uh, call in at the call center number at any given point of time and avail of telephone banking or, or any other you know 24 seven support services. The customer needs to be, informed of the fact that his data is going to be shared with this third party data processor. This is one of the requirements of GDPR. Now, if this third party data processor falls outside of the list of EU approved countries, um, there are 11 countries that have been approved by the European Commission, uh, which are located outside of the European Union itself. Now, if this country, if this call center is not located within these 11 countries, and the data is being shared with these countries, one of the factors that has to be, um, that has to justify the data transfer to this outside country is what we call explicit consent. Explicit consent has to be obtained from the data subject to justify this transfer. All right, this is one of the ways in which you can justify the transfer. There are also other mechanisms as well. All right, so like you get the idea, essentially what we need, what we see is the individual is made to, uh, made to be the one who decides whether his data is gonna go outside of this, outside of the European Union or not. And if it is going to go, what is the reason for which it's going to be shared outside? And how can he or she have control over his data when it is going outside? All right. Supervising the entire process, every country in the EU has what we call a national data protection authority. All right. Now, these are organizations that are already in existence. In fact, for example, in the UK, uh, we have an organization called the ICO, Information Commissioner's Office. And um, in France, for example, we have what we call the CNIL, all right? It, it expands in French, so you can look it up if you're interested, it's called CNIL. This is a data protection authority for France. These organizations have been tasked with enforcing GDPR within their own member states, within their own nations rather, right? So these are the organizations that have to make sure that, that GDPR is being enforced um, correctly and as per the required um, objectives within their own member nations. All right, now this actually begets a question, is there gonna be a difference 
in the way GDPR is applied across each member nation? There is an answer to that, and we're going to come to it over one of the next few slides. Perfect. Guys, now I hope you understood the entities that are involved in GDPR. This is very, very straightforward and easy to understand as well. With this, let's move on to the next slide. Perfect. Now I'm going to discuss what are the uh, discuss the what aspects of GDPR. All right. So, um, like I said, GDPR stands for the General Data Protection Regulation. All right, and it is being it's being it was preceded by what we call the Data Protection Directive. All right. Now, in the previous slide, I told you there's going to be a question on how GDPR is going to be applied across EU member states. The fact that it's a regulation means it is immediately effective in a consistent mechanism across the entire European Union. So this itself is a very, very important fact because there's going to be no confusion in terms of interpreting GDPR requirements based on which country we are addressing. Now, you know how massive the EU is and the number of countries that, are, that exist within the EU itself. So we're having one consistent approach across the European Union for implementing a regulation means it's going to be a lot simpler than its, than its predecessor, which was the Data Protection Directive. The Data Protection Directive um, of, uh, was actually uh, uh, structured in such a way that it had to be interpreted to, by each member state based on its own unique national circumstances. With the GDPR, this does not apply uh, anymore. In fact, it's going to be uniform and consistently applied across the entire EU. All right. The main focus of GDPR is personal data and sensitive personal data of EU individuals. Personal data is any data that can be used to identify a natural person. All right, so this is a definition which is derived from the definition of uh, of the data subject itself. Uh, GDPR does not explicitly define personal data, but you can you can interpret the definition from the definition of a of a data subject, all right, which we saw on the on the previous slide. So we have specific categories for personal data and as well as sensitive personal data, which are defined under GDPR. Um, your, for example, the racial um, origins, the biometric information, the religious views, political views, all of these data is considered to be sensitive personal data. Whereas your, your name and um, you know, other basic information about you will be considered to be your personal data. All right. Um, let me just clear up the screen. The scope of GDPR, it applies to any organization that processes EU individuals' personal data or is actually monitoring their behavior as long as the behavior occurs within the European Union. Guys, do not worry about the scope. I, I have a specific slide on this itself, but I'm, I'm sure you're aware. It applies to organizations who are still, who are not even physically located inside the EU, right? Um, so even if you're an organization that is located across the meter region, as long as your business has a specific EU focus to it, GDPR would apply to you. All right, so when I say EU focus, what does this mean? I'll, I'll explain this on one of the upcoming slides. In fact, I believe it's the next slide itself, all right? Another important aspect of GDPR, in fact, one of the reasons GDPR has been given really, really good teeth is the fines. I'm sure you've heard of this as well. Um, your fines can be as high as 20 million euro or 4% of your worldwide uh, annual turnover, whichever is higher. Okay, so we're looking at a minimum fine of 10 million euro for level one fines and level two fines can be as high as 20 million euro or 4%, whichever is higher. And like you see, right, these are not uh, paltry sums. These are significant fines. And this is one of the areas where with GDPR is in fact a lot, lot stronger than uh, most of the privacy regulations. Um, in fact, we believe it's just a matter of time before the first organization to be levied a fine upon uh, comes out in the news, right? So it's, it's already been about a week now since GDPR came into effect. So we need to wait and see who the first organization is that's going to be uh, fined, right? All right. Who does GDPR apply to? Guys, like I said, I have a specific slide only talking about the scope of GDPR. Um, now, there are two kinds of questions to be uh, addressed. Are you as a person covered under GDPR? That's question number one. And question number two is, is your organization being covered under GDPR? All right, so we're gonna address this question from these two perspectives. So as a person, like I said earlier, it applies to you, you are covered under GDPR if you are an EU individual. And how do you define EU individual? A person who is either a citizen or a resident of the European Union. Okay, a, a natural legal resident, that is. So if, if any of these factors apply to you, definitely you are being protected by the General Data Protection Regulation. This is great. All right. Now, this is the, the, the bigger question is, does GDPR apply to your organization itself? You as a data controller or a data processor itself? All right, the questions that you need to address are, are you established in the EU and are you processing personal data? 
So when I say establishment, it does not necessarily mean you have a physical office in the EU. It's just sufficient that you have a website that is targeting a specific EU nation, like for example, France or Hungary or whatever it is. As long as your website has a domain name that is registered in an EU country, or if you have a bank account that has been established um, or that is based in one of the EU nations, this itself is probably sufficient to uh, interpret your organization as having an EU establishment, all right? So, and this is coming uh, from one of the cases, one of the actual court cases that was uh, contested in the EU a couple of years back, all right? Uh, one, one of the companies was, uh, was, was claiming that we don't have an EU establishment because we don't have an office in the EU. However, the court, the European Court of Justice, uh, ruled against their favor by stating that, guys, we know you don't have a physical office in this country, the country being Hungary for that matter. But you have a website that is written in Hungarian language, you're targeting Hungarian um, citizens, and uh, you also have a bank account which is established um, in, in Hungary itself, plus you have a postcode which is from Hungary, right? So all these factors deem that you have an establishment in the EU itself, and thereby you are liable to pay fines for non-compliance uh, with certain regulations. So it is not uh, enough just not to have a physical office, but just the fact that you target a specific EU nation is enough for a court to interpret that you have an EU establishment. So this is something that organizations need to keep in mind, guys. All right. The other question is, even if you're not physically located or not having a good establishment in the EU itself, are you offering goods and services to EU-related individuals or EU-related citizens? If the answer is yes, then GDPR definitely applies to you. For meta organizations, this is where most, almost all of them are going to fall under scope, right? So if you are, uh, let's say, a, a hotel or, or a travel agency and you are expecting European Union citizens or individuals to use your services to, for example, visit um, um, your specific countries, n no matter where they're located in the world, GDPR would apply to you, all right? Um, and the other question is, what if you're monitoring EU-related data subjects' behavior as long as the behavior occurs within the EU? All right, now this is, for example, an online behavioral advertising company. Most of these companies are uh, located outside of the EU and offering services to EU-specific countries, right? So they, they track people's behavior as they, as they browse specific websites. They look at what links they're clicking, uh, what is the data that they are entering on web forms, or, or, and so on and so forth. As long as this behavior of EU individuals is occurring within the EU, it doesn't matter where this company is located as. If it is tracking this behavior, they would have to be uh, you know, covered under GDPR. So the, for the meter region, the biggest question is, or the biggest category would be the one that you see here in the middle. If you are offering goods and services to EU-related individuals who are located in the EU, definitely GDPR would apply to you. So whether you're an airline, whether you're a transport company, logistics company, um, or, or, or even an e-commerce company, um, who is shipping to the EU, uh, or like the examples that we spoke of earlier, the hospitality sector, if you're a hotel, or, or if you're a travel agent, and so on and so forth, GDPR would definitely, definitely apply to you. Wonderful. So guys, with this context, let's move on to the next section, which is the data processing principles. Now this slide, the, the bullet points that you see over here, there are six of them. These have to be highlighted because they actually form the foundation of GDPR. All right, the basis of GDPR itself is on, on the data processing principles. And what, what they mean is any data that an organization collects, stores, processes, or trans, transfer, uh, transmits has to be done on the basis of these factors. First of all, your data, should, your data processing should be lawful, which means you should be collecting the data for a legal purpose, like you see it mentioned over here. It should not be for an illegal purpose, like for example, to, to carry out a cyber attack on an individual. Um, it should be fair and it should be transparent. So it should be collected using methods that are available, uh, that, that, are, that have been informed to the data subject in a transparent mechanism. And plus it should also be fair to the data subject. There should be the concepts of purpose limitation and data minimization as well. What do I mean by these? So for instance, you need to specify clearly what purpose it is that you're gonna collect the data for. And then you need to collect the data only which is required to meet that specific purpose. So for instance, when I go to open up a bank account, the bank account, the, the, the bank should actually specify the purposes for which they're gonna collect my data. The purpose being, I need to open an account, a bank account for this individual, all right? And then when I say data minimization, they'll collect only the data that is required to open the bank account, all right? So they would, they would require, like I said earlier, your name, your, your date of birth, your passport, for example, your existing financial details and so on. 
but they would not require your parents' passport information for, let's say, for instance, or, or um, um, your, your previous passport's information and so on. So only the data that is directly proportionate or directly relevant to the stated purpose has to be complied, has to be collected. Okay, the next, the next aspect is accuracy. They'll have to take reasonable measures to ensure that the data collected is accurate and updated as well to make sure that the da that databases have, uh, are adhering to the principles of data quality. And then there is a principle of storage limitation as well, which means they hold on to the data only for the duration of time for which they need it. And this dur duration of time has to be defined. So a defined retention period has to be made available. And lastly, data security also has to be uh, adhered to at all points in time. In, uh, confidentiality and integrity of the data has to be upheld at all points throughout the entire data processing life cycle. Perfect. So guys, if you read up on GDPR, you're sure to run into these in, in the, in, within the first two hours of itself because they form the foundation of the regulation. Um, and you need to understand these principles. Everything that GDPR talks about is, is ingrained um, or, or founded on these, found, on these principles of data processing. Wonderful. Let's move on to the next section, which is GDPR implementation. So guys, let me do a quick recap. We looked at what GDPR is and why GDPR had to come into existence. We looked at the various entities in GDPR and how, especially in the meta region, GDPR is likely to apply to you, the scope of GDPR. And like I said, it's most likely to apply to a meta organization if they're offering goods and services to EU individuals, irrespective of whether they are physically located in the EU or not. Uh, even, for example, when they travel to the EU, to, uh, outside of the EU to your countries in the meta region, um, you would have to be compliant with GDPR, GDPR in terms of how you're collecting, processing, and storing their data. We also looked at the data processing principles, and like I said, they found the foundations of GDPR itself. With this foundational uh, information, guys, we're going to look at a GDPR implementation roadmap. And this is what you see up here on your screen, a four-phased approach for actually implementing GDPR. Guys, this is something that Ingram Micro has developed. This is the methodology that we advocate for GDPR implementation. Um, and we're, talk we're looking at four phases for actually building and maintaining a privacy management program, right? What we're, done, what we're doing is we're taking this framework and we're mapping GDPR requirements, which, which you can see neatly written down over here, to the various phases, all right? So if you are an organization that is looking to understand GDPR and actually start building a compliance framework um, in case you haven't already done so, this, is, this section is going to tell you what you need to be doing. This is what we're going to be discussing now, how you can go about and actually implement GDPR. All right, so like I said, four phases. Let's start with the SS phase. The first point is appointment of a data protection officer. And guys, like I said earlier, a DPO is something that GDPR has brought in, a new position itself. This person is required to be the expert on GDPR, the go-to guy essentially in the organization for all questions and all solutions related to GDPR. All right, so essentially a privacy champion itself. And, and GDPR requires that this person report to the highest officer, the highest uh, position of office within the organization, which, is, uh, which, which can be interpreted as being the CEO itself. All right, uh, and GDPR also requires that the organization give the DPO complete independence uh, because his position or her position would actually require that they function um, uh, pretty much like an internal auditor, let's say. So they would have complete independence in their operations, plus the DPO would have to be given um, access to training materials as well so they can keep their privacy knowledge and expertise updated at all points in time. What are the qualifications that GDPR sets um, a person needs to have to become a DPO? Um, significant expertise in uh, privacy, in, in the field of privacy, data protection and privacy itself. This is all that GDPR clearly men mentions. But when you look at the industry, the, you would demand that they have specific certifications as well, guys. And I'll, I'll bring, I'll come to this in a minute. I'll talk about how GDPR, uh, or sorry, DPO specific certifications can actually be achieved and where Ingram Micro can actually help you in relation to this. All right, so the first step that you need to do is hire a DPO for yourself. Uh, another point, guys, you don't need to meet, uh, have a full-time employee as a, you don't need to have the DPO as a full-time employee. Uh, if you feel that um, it, it makes sense to outsource a DPO, that is also allowed by GDPR. So there are, there are organizations that have a qualified pool of DPOs that can be, um, uh, you know, outsourced by client organizations. You can get in touch with these guys and just, you know, um, have a, a, a a part-time employee as a GDPR, as a data protection officer, as long as 
this this uh, employment arrangement does not hinder with his or her um, carrying out of GDPR specific duties in a sufficient manner. All right, so there should not be really any difference between having him as a full time or a part time employee, but it does not mandate that he has to be a full time employee. GDPR. All right, so the next question that you need to address is your scoping. What is the material scope and what is the territorial scope of my personal data? Because this is um, something which is very, very foundational, not only to GDPR implementation, but to any information security or privacy program. When you decide to protect your data, the first thing you need to do is identify what data you have and where is this data actually present. This is what we mean by material scope and territorial scope. In material scope, I'll try to identify what pieces of personal data my organization deals with. And then in territorial scope, what are the countries outside of the EU that I'm actually transferring my data to? All right. So we come out with a proper inventory sheet that has a complete list of your customers or your, your partners or third party source providers data that you have access to. And then you come out with a list of countries that you're actually sharing this data with, if at all there are any. All right. And then now you need to map them to the data processing principles, which I mentioned here in articles 5 to 11. The data processing principles, guys, you remember we just discussed these. And like I said, they form the foundation of your GDPR principles itself. So every piece of data that your organization collects or transmits or stores has to be compliant with the data processing principles. So this gap assessment has to be carried out in the assess phase itself. All right, now with that foundational um, setup in place, we now start to develop our protection mechanism. All right, so this is where we need to look at specific areas that GDPR emphasizes, like for instance, consent and data subject rights. But before we actually start with, with consent and, and, sub, and data subject rights, we need to look at data protection uh, controls itself, data protection by design and data protection by default. And how we do this is we start with what we call a data protection impact assessment. All right, this is an exercise that is mandated by GDPR and essentially it's, it's, um, it is not to be confused with what we call a data security risk assessment. Rather, a DPIA is an exercise that, that looks at what are the privacy specific risks that your operations are carrying out or are bringing about to your organization. So risks and impact from a privacy perspective have to be identified across the entire operations of the organization. It has to be documented and an overall rating or risk rating has to be arrived upon. And guess what? The DPO has to be the person who signs off on this risk on this final rating and makes sure that it is within an acceptable limit. As an outcome of the DPIA, you will have an idea of what controls are, are existing in your organization and where your control posture needs to be improved. So from there, we'll start looking at your data protection by design and data protection by default aspects as well. We start designing our controls. I mean, let me just uh, annotate to make this a little clearer. Yeah, so so we, we, we start designing our controls. Um, and make sure that we adhere to data protection by design and data protection by default, privacy by design and by default principles as well. Because what do I mean by privacy by design or, uh, or by default? Uh, some of us might have the answers, but just to be sure everyone does, let me just elaborate on this. Uh, what I mean by privacy by design is when you start designing a, an information system, this can be an application, it can be a, system, um, it can be a piece of hardware, it can be a new business process itself. When you start designing or planning out this particular um, uh, entity itself, you need to start talking about privacy. You need to identify what are the privacy risks that this particular system is likely to, to bring about and how are you going to address these risks. All right. So the concepts of privacy have to be embedded right at the very, very early stages of the life cycle of an information system. This is what privacy by design means. And what I mean by privacy by default, um, the, very, the end user should be expected to carry out nothing. To, and to provide his maximum level of privacy. So what, what this means is, for instance, you, you provide a system to, a, to, a, to an end user, the basic or default configuration means that privacy concepts are being upheld, all right, and not that privacy concepts are being violated. And the same applies to the security world as well. If someone needs to bypass these systems, these, these basic default configurations, they would have to make, go by a change request mechanism um, with separation of duties as well involved. So what this means is I'll have to raise a request to, uh, to bypass the default security or privacy configuration and then get an approval. But this is where separation of duties comes in and only then can I actually go ahead and carry out my bypass request for, um, for privacy or security. All right. We also start looking at where we can implement data pseudonymization. Guys, like I said, pseudonymization is a new concept that has been brought in by GDPR. Um, what do I mean by this? So let's say for instance, um, I have I have a list of names. Let's say the names of everybody who's in this room here with us. 
All right, I have a list of your names. Um, everywhere that I use your names to refer to you, I am employed to apply spe specific security controls, right? Uh, like for instance, let's say encryption to make sure that I am adhering to, um, uh, to to protecting your confidentiality of your data. Now, I find it too expensive to go about encrypting simple things like your names um, or, or dates of birth, for instance, let's say. It might be easier for me to refer to myself, Praveen, instead of referring to me as Praveen, I have an algorithm that maps the letters of my name to a specific key, okay? So the letter P is mapped to, let's say, the number one. Uh, the letter R is mapped to the number five and so on and so forth. So I have an algorithm that is able to map the letters in your name to specific uh, tokens, so to speak. So I have these tokens that refer individually to each of you uh, in this room. And instead of referring to you by name, I just refer to you by the tokens, right? So as long as these tokens, the mapping between the name and the token, as long as I'm protecting the algorithm that maps the name to the token, um, I'm able to actually use the tokens freely without having to apply specific or stringent controls like encryption. So it's a concept that is very, very similar to tokenization. Those of you who are familiar with PCI DSS would have definitely heard of tokenization, wherein you use a token rather than actually using the card holder number. It's very, very similar to this, but it's definitely not as strong as encryption. However, GDPR really, really advocates this, and there are a lot of benefits that organizations can, can, uh, can accrue if they decide to go ahead with implementing pseudonymization. So in fact, you see it here, we use a pseudonym instead of the actual piece of personal data itself. So that's what pseudonymization is all about, developing a token or a pseudonym rather than using the actual piece of personal data itself. All right, so we have to identify areas where it is feasible to go ahead and actually deploy pseudonymization. This is something that is carried out in the product phase as well. And then lastly, we go about with the data security principles. We start, we start implementing the controls to make sure that data's confidentiality, integrity, and availability is being upheld at all points in time. All right. And in adherence with the territorial scope, we start making sure that any country that we are transferring our personal data or our customers' personal data to, we are doing it on the basis of derogations. Okay. Now, like I said, explicit consent is one of the factors of, on which GDPR actually allows cross-border data transfers. Um, guys, let me let me uh, start fresh in terms of cross-border data transfers. The European Commission has a list of 11 approved countries, all right? And these countries include, for example, the Faroe Islands, Switzerland, um, Canada, Australia, and so on and so forth. These are non-EU nations, right? You can transfer con your personal data to these countries just like as if they were a part of the EU. This, the, the European Commission has no problems with this. However, and this is more likely to be the case, if you're transferring personal data to any of the countries in the world who do not belong to the EU or do not fall within this list of 11 nations, this data transfer has to be done on the basis of what we call derogations, all right, which is something like exceptions. One of the examples of a derogation is explicit consent. You get explicit consent from the data subject and tell them, guys, I'm going to transfer your data to, let's say, India or China or wherever it is. I need your explicit consent. Explicit consent is consent which, is, uh, which requires an active uh, active action from the data subject to, to show the fact that they are actually okay with the data being sent out. So it shouldn't be something where uh, you have a pre-ticked pre -ticked checkbox that is, that is sent to the, to the data subject as an email. Rather, it should have a message and an okay button that the, that the data subject has actually got to click on actively to show that, yes, I'm all right with the fact that you're going to transfer my data over to this third-party country. I'm all, I'm all right with this. Right. So in many cases, you will need explicit consent. Um, and this is one of these one of the cases where explicit consent is required to, to justify the fact that you're going to be transferring data to one of the non-EU approved nations. All right. It does not always have to be explicit consent, guys. There are also other derogations that, the G, that GDPR lists out. Um, another one being um, the use of binding contractual uh, requirements or what we call BCRs. All right. Now, this is, for example, in the case of multinational uh, corporations, MNCs. Um, who have an EU establishment and they are falling under GDPR, but they want to transfer the data to their own offices, which are located in a non-EU approved country. So this is where we have BCRs or a contractual agreement between the two entities, uh, the one that falls within the GDPR scope, the data controller, let's say, and the data processor who falls within a non-GDPR or non-EU approved country. Or you, you sign upon each other with each other with a BCR or a binding contractual regulation, and this would be sufficient to justify the transfer. So in the protect phase, we will identify what is the most suitable uh, derogation on which we have to found or on which you have to base the uh, data transfer and make sure that it is in adherence with the GDPR articles. 
All right, so this comes in under articles 44 to 50 of GDPR. Um, the, each derogation is an article in its own. So we'll need to make sure that this compliance is being adhered to. And then the most important one, which is number one, is adherence to consent as well as data subject rights itself. Let me talk a little bit about this as well. So GDPR defines consent as, um, uh, as something that is freely given, specific, as well as, um, uh, as, well as unambiguous. All right, so what this means is the data controller sends a message to the data subject and tells them, guys, I am collecting your data and I'm going to be using it in these XYZ mechanisms. All right, so this is, um, and I need your consent for this. The data subject has to freely give his consent. And this means the consent should not be tied upon the service itself. Like for instance, if you do not consent, you cannot use my service. This is a wrong message and GDPR strongly criticizes this. All right, it has to be freely given. It has to be specific. So it has to be really, really tied down to the purpose, um, the purpose limitation and the data minimization concepts that we, that we saw in the, um, uh, in the data processing principles slide. And it has to be unambiguous, which means again, it has to be very, very clear cut and very, very specific itself. All right, so consent has to be sought upon by, from data subjects for, by, for, for various requirements under GDPR and, and the data controllers have to make sure that the, the pieces of personal data that they are processing are um, uh, are actually being carried out on the basis of consent. And there's another beautiful aspect, which is data subject rights. Like I said, GDPR brings in a lot of, a lot of rights that data subjects have, which include, for example, the right to be forgotten, uh, the right to request transfer or data portability from, from data processor A to data processor B, or data controller A to data controller B rather, um, uh, the right to make amends or rectify the records that are being held by the, um, by the data controller. I want you to make a correction on the data, on the records that you hold about me. Um, and then there's also a right to uh, request access. I want you to give me a, a copy of all my data that you are holding. All right, this is something that you and I are probably already familiar with. So for instance, with Facebook, uh, you have an access, you have an ability to download your data that Facebook actually holds, right? So this is actually what we call the right to access. You as a data controller would have to make sure that your data subjects have the right to exercise their data subject rights. So when I say subject data subject access requests, this is what we call subject access requests or SARs. You probably need to have a web page at least where a subject data subject can can go online and and submit a data subject access request. And you as a data controller have 60 days within which you have to get back to the uh, uh, to the data subject. So two months is max all that you get, and you need to get back to them uh, with a copy of the data or at least an update of the fact that you're working on getting a copy of the data. All right, um, and talk, think about the data portability requirements. So for instance, um, I am, I'm a company X and I have uh, a copy of, um, of my customer's data, let's say. The subject requests that I want you to transfer my data to your direct competitor. All right, now I have, a, I, I have data that is organized in a specific mechanism based on my backend infrastructure. How do I make sure that my data is compliant um, or, or my data organization mechanism, my database itself can be compatible with the one that is being used by my competitor. All right, there are gonna be a lot of technical challenges here. How do I make sure I can transfer data in a, form, in a format that my competitors can also use just because my data subject has come out with a data subject, with a data portability request. All right, so these are again, massive challenges that lie ahead of organizations and they need to start, need to start looking at how they can have an interoperable format between their peers itself in the industry so data portability requirements can be met. All right, so the protect phase, like you can see, this is going to be the one where we spend the maximum amount of time, and that's the reason there are a lot of activities here. Um, um, and once you've completed phases one and two, you are technically in a state where you have met all the GDPR requirements. All right, so technically you're ready for certification, although unfortunately today certification is not a reality. We don't have organizations that can certify, but there are what we call the codes of conduct as well as certification mechanisms that GDPR talks about. So what, what GDPR says is organizations have to be formed um, that, 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 that are called approved monitoring bodies or approved certification bodies. And these are organizations that can be tasked with actually auditing and certifying organizations against GDPR. As of now, we don't have these organizations as we speak, but we hope to have them soon. Um, and these organizations are also expected to come out with what we call codes of conduct. All right, the, 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 these can pretty much be mapped to the specific requirements of GDPR itself and come, and come out with a list of rules that organizations need to follow to be uh, compliant with GDPR on an ongoing basis. So essentially, on an ongoing basis, your compliance is being monitored and it's being sustained um, without any violations at a given point in time.
And of course, there are the fines. At, if at a given point in time, an organization is found to be in violation of GDPR requirements, you would be, uh, the fines would be imposed upon them. So they have to have mechanisms where they can actually um, uh, you know, either pay up on the fines or contest at least the fines that have been imposed upon them. The last phase is the respond phase, guys. This is where, like I said earlier, you need to have at least a web page to respond to data subject access requests. And you need to have mechanisms to notify individuals or data subjects of the fact that their data has been breached, if at all your organization has suffered a data security breach. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about this as well, but I see that we are slightly running uh, short on time. So I'm gonna pick up the pace, guys, because I have a few more slides. Um, let me go quickly over to the next slide where I'm going to detail a little bit about each of these phases. All right, so the assess phase, like I said, and this slide reiterates this, one of the key, key activities that needs to be carried out in the assess phase is the appointment of a DPO. Let me just get my pen here. The appointment of the DPO. And like I said, this is mandatory for all organizations that are involved in large-scale processing of personal data of EU individuals or large-scale monitoring of EU individuals. It's also mandatory for public authorities, guys, which is your all which is your government organizations. Now, the question is, what do I mean by large-scale processing? Unfortunately, GDPR has not given a cutoff, a cutoff or a threshold value, so it is really up to the organizations to interpret this. But like I said, your DPO would be the data protection expert or the champion. And he would liaise again with the data subject, with the supervisory authorities, and also report to the highest level of management, like I said, preferably the CEO. All right, there are specific certifications which DPOs would be expected to hold. And these are the ones that you see on your screen, the CIPPE and the CIPM. Guys, if you're not familiar with them, do not worry. I'm going to talk about them on one of the upcoming, session, on one of the upcoming slides. All right, um, I'm moving on to the next phase. which is the protect phase. And like I said, this is the phase that is gonna consume maximum time as well as effort, uh, because you're essentially you're building and you're designing your controls around protection of personal data. And two of the most important examples of what you see up here on your screen, we have the data protection by design, as well as the data protection by default concepts to be taken care of. Data pseudonymization, I've explained this as well. Um, one of the benefits of implementing these controls is that you have specific ex exemptions as a data controller that GDPR actually helps you to benefit from. How do you go about doing this? You come out with a data inventory and, um, and come out with a data flow chart or, or a data, data flow diagram rather. Have a list of all the pieces of data that you have and then go about designing your control. How can Ingram Micro help you here? We have specific data classification services, guys. And if you remember, I told you about the data protection impact assessment. If you, if you can recall, it is an assessment that looks at the privacy specific risks and impacts that your business operations entail. Our consultants are able to do this for you. In case you have lacked the technical expertise, guys, we are able to come on site and do this for you. But your DPO would have to be the person who signs off on the final levels of risk, like I said earlier, and make sure that it is within an acceptable levels of risk. All right. The next phase is sustain. And like I said, this is where you need to make sure your compliance is maintained on an ongoing basis. Um, there are significant fines. We can help you to make sure that you are staying clear of these fines uh, by means of, for example, carrying out a GDPR readiness assessment or even actual GDPR implementation services. All right, and with a, a quick note on the fines, this is where, guys, um, I'll, I'm bringing you to the next phase, the breach notification guidelines. Guys, um, let me just clear the annotations. Guys, GDPR has very, very stringent rules on breach notifications, right? Um, so for instance, if you as an organization suffer a data security breach, um, you have just about, you just, you just have about 72 hours within which you, you have to notify the supervisory authority of the fact that you've been breached. All right, 72 hours just as, I mean, this is about three days, that's all you have, within which you have to verify the fact that you have been breached and hopefully have a good understanding of what the level of impact is of this breach. So within three days, this update has to go to the supervisory authority. And, um, and realistically speaking, um, we, we really don't know how well organizations can meet this requirement. Um, and also the data processor, if they have suffered a breach, they have, um, GDPR does not specify a, a finite timeline, but, they, but it states that they have to notify immediately to the data controller of the fact that they've been breached. So just as soon as you, you discover a breach and you've verified the fact that this is a breach, you just have about three days as a data controller 
to notify the supervisory authority of the fact that you've been breached. All right, this has to be followed up with more detailed analysis of the impacts of the breach and, and, uh, and how long it's gonna take before the organization recovers from the breach. And hopefully if you have the root cause analysis as well completed, you need to send this as well to the supervisory authority. Um, in cases of high risks to data subjects, the data, so the data controller would probably be required to send individual notifications to the data subjects as well. Guys, if you remember last year, we had the Equifax breach. Uh, this is one of the most com one of the best examples, a classic example of, of all the factors that we just discussed being violated. All right. So, for instance, a breach was discovered by the organization sometime around June or July last year, and they took about three months before they even notified this to the public. All right. So, three months versus three days that GDPR is talking about. So, like you, like I said earlier, right, data security breaches is one of the most important factors that GDPR has actually brought into existence itself. All right, very, very stringent regulations and organizations to actually start notifying individuals um, of data security breaches. And the Equifax breach, in fact, was presenting a very, very high risk to data subjects. And the company followed through with individual emails, individual notifications to each of the customers who were impacted in this, inc in this incident. And this was about 143 million American citizens and, and a significant number of people from the, US, from, from the UK as well. All right, so these, this is a very, very good example of what GDPR is seeking to correct. Although Equifax did, well, was, had nothing, nothing much to do with GDPR, in fact, it happened last year. Uh, it's a very, very good example of what GDPR is seeking to correct. All right? And how, G, how we can help you guys is in terms of avoiding data security breaches itself. All right? So uh, we, do, we can do data security risk assessments, or like I said earlier, GDPR readiness, readiness assessments or gap assessments to look at your existing posture. All right, now with each of these phases, guys, I've been highlighting how Ingram Micro can help you um, in terms of implementing or, or uh, uh, achieving compliance with GDPR. This is what I'm gonna be talking about on the next slide. Um, what are Ingram Micro's GDPR specific solutions? All right, this slide should take about five minutes this section and, um, and five minutes for your questions as well, further to which we'd be able to close today's uh, webinar. Perfect. Up here on your slide, you see on, on your screen, you see the complete suite of solutions that we offer from Ingram Micro. Guys, I come, I come from the Ingram Micro cybersecurity team and, uh, and, and this is exactly the list of uh, solutions that we can actually help you with. All the technical assessments, we offer public discovery um, reports, all the, which is a free service, all the way down to complex pen tests as well as vulnerability assessments. You might ask me, how does this relate to to GDPR because these are extremely focused on cybersecurity. I'll take you back to the protect phase that, that we saw in, um, in the GDPR implementation roadmap. We spoke about article 32, which was GDPR, which was data security. All right, so when you talk about data security, you need to really start with the basis, with the basics with your technical infrastructure, which is your vulnerability assessments, your pen tests, um, your web app scans, and as well as your web malware detections and so your source code reviews as well. We help you with this. Uh, on, and on the consultancy front, like I said, we have a team of consultants, myself included, we can work with you, your end customers, as well as your, um, uh, your own organizations itself for that matter. We can come on site and actually do gap assessments, risk assessments, and GDPR implementation itself for your organization. Um, the framework that I showed you, this is what we'd be following. Um, and like, like you saw, it is perfectly mapped to the GDPR articles as well. So we have a very, very clear cut strategy to execute the project as well for you. Uh, we also have managed security services. This is more in line again with Article 32, your data security. We have a SOC um, from where we can monitor your organization's security posture. If you've suffered a data security breach, we can also help you with your data security incident response uh, mechanisms. We can help you in terms of notification, breach notification to your data protection, of, um, uh, to your DPAs um, or your supervisory authorities. Um, we can help you in also carrying out the incident response analysis itself. So we can help in identifying the root cause of the incident, steps to prevent the incident from recurring, um, and also make it measuring your, um, your, your incident containment measures and how quickly you're able to recover business operations from the incident. In terms of trainings, we have a whole suite of trainings, guys, which I'd, I'm directly responsible for. Uh, we have trainings for end users as well as um, cybersecurity experts, as well as your privacy team itself. Uh, so end users who need to be made aware of security as well as privacy, we have trainings for them. As well as for cybersecurity teams, we have um, uh, trainings on certifications, CISSP, CISSP included, as well as on risk and compliance. 
But the most important and relevant ones for GDPR would be your CIPP E and CIPM. Guys, like I said, these are the most relevant certifications that a data protection officer can hold. CIPP E is completely aligned with GDPR and CIPM talks about establishing a privacy management program. And these trainings come to you from IAPP, the International Association of Privacy Professionals. It is the most reputed, the most premier privacy organization in the world, guys. And we have partnered with them to bring these trainings to you. These are two-day trainings, um, generally delivered in, pro in person, but we can also do online sessions uh, if, if you're not located within the meter region, but um, we can do online sessions as well. Our trainers are certified. They hold these certifications. And when you sign up for these certifications, guys, you get one-year IAPP membership plus um, the training, plus the certification, plus all the study material that you need as well. Um, and in addition to all this, you have an online access to uh, IAPP's portal where you have e-learning materials for the, on the entire syllabus. So in addition to the e-book, you also get e-learnings as well. And personally, I have, I am, I am using these resources. I am a member as well of IAPP, and I see that these are extremely good quality. In fact, the best in the world in terms of privacy. All right. So I really, really strongly recommend these. And if you want to get trained and certified um, on on CIPPE or CIPM, do get in touch with me. Um, more than happy to work with you on these. Guys, um, it's two minutes past two and um, I'm complete, I've, I've completed the session. Uh, thank you so much for your attention and I hope it was helpful. Uh, guys, if you have any questions, now would be the time. Please feel free to, to chat away, use the Q&A window. More than happy to address your questions. All right, I take it that we have no questions. Guys, let me thank you again for your attention. Um, there's a question here from Fuad about uh, sharing the recording. Uh, no problem, Fuad, I'll make sure that everybody has access to the webinar recording as well. Uh, and there, all, there was a question about sharing the slides from Vinny. I'm, Vinny, I'm gonna, ch I'm gonna check, about, check on this and come back to you if this can be shared. Uh, but if there's no other questions, guys, let me thank you once again for your attention. I hope, I hope this was beneficial to you. And I hope you have an idea about GDPR and what you need to do to start um, implementing the, the regulation in your organizations. Um, plus, like I said, let me reiterate, Ingram Micro is available to help you handhold you through the entire process. Um, the trainings as well as the implementation mechanisms, get in touch with us, we're more than happy to work with you on these. Thank you guys and have an excellent rest of the day. Uh, Ramdan Kareem, see you.